I still have to discuss uh, evaluation of fugacity coefficients. The formula is very simple. If the equation of state, we have already seen the equation of state for example, Van der Waals we have seen did show the corresponding states principle first of all P plus A by V squared into V minus B. I think in reduced form we have P reduce plus I do not remember here but there is a constant there P reduce squared into V reduced minus 3 is equal to some constant I forget the constant there into T reduced. It is 8 by 3 or something like that, I do not remember. Some constant. If you remember, we wrote the cubic equation and equated and showed that as you can show that B is Pc by 3 and A is R, no, it is Pc Vc squared again is proportional to Pc Vc squared. So, I think there is a constant here also not necessarily one. So, there are two constants, but the point about the Van der Waals principle was that P r was equal to some function of T r and V r. In general you should know that V c is very very difficult to measure critical volume. So, very often V r is defined is V by V c, but V r can also be taken as V divided by R T c by P c. I will say or either of the it is in some correlations you non dimensionalize the volume using T c and P c rather than using an idealized critical volume if you like. The ideal gas really does not have a critical point because there is no condensation, but one of these is used, but basically you get this equation. This is the equation fundamental equation for corresponding states. What it says is that at the same T r and V r the reduced pressure is the same for all substances. It is a universal it is an equation the corresponding state means for every T and V of a reference substance there is a T and V of the actual substance for which the T reduced and V reduced are the same under those conditions P by P C is the same for both substances. So, it is sufficient in principle to measure the data for say argon easy to measure and uh, you make all the measurements for argon put the equation of state the empirical measurements in this form and then you can use it for any other substance provided you measure T C P C and V C. So, really it is a matter of reducing one is universalization second is reducing experimental data, but uh, more universally this implies some function of T r and V r implies that Z c is equal to constant. In the case of Van der Waals Z c comes out to be 3 by 8. So, example Van der Waals again Z c is equal to 3 by 8 which is much greater than the experimentally observed value. Experimental values actually vary more like uh, between 0 0.2 and 0 0.35 wide variation Z C values and uh, typically for many substances I think for the inert gases it is about 0.27. So, argon, krypton, neon, xenon all these can be correlated very well methane etcetera 
and then you start having departures. So what people suggested was as this is the first corresponding states this is called the simple corresponding states principle. All other corresponding states principles simply add more parameters to this. So you write PR is equal to function of TR, PR and say alpha where alpha is some characteristic parameter essentially this characteristic parameter should have ideally it should be distinct for distinct substances if substances behave differently then alpha should be correspondingly different it should be easily measurable. So only two requirements uh, should be sufficiently different for different substances and should be measurable. easily measurable. Historically the first one that was tried was alpha equal to ZC itself actually it is taken as ZC minus ZC0 because for simple inert substances ZC0 is the critical compressibility factor say for argon for inert gases and methane and so on if you take this difference as the parameter then it becomes very convenient you can then do if you do this you can then write PR is equal to F of you can expand this in Taylor expansion F0 of TR PR comma alpha 0 plus the first derivative of this times the value of alpha actually alpha 0 is 0. So plus alpha let us call this F1 so you make a Taylor series expansion you can write PR is equal to this actually normally it is rather than PR you write Z itself the compressibility factor which is dimensionless so or Z. ZC is the critical compressibility factor Z is the compressibility factor Z is PV by RT ZC is the value at the critical point it is just a third parameter it should be different because you would like to use it the reason for using a Taylor series expansion is the following if I now measure for argon when alpha is equal to 0 this term will disappear I get enough information from just argon measurements then let us say I do a measurement for carbon dioxide for which I know alpha then carbon dioxide will give me F0 plus this whole thing of which this is known. So from the left hand side measurements for carbon dioxide I can calculate F1 this is actually partial of F with respect to alpha at alpha equal to 0 but I do not have to look at it that way it is just a function of TR and PR and I can get it from experimental data once I get it for uh, argon and carbon dioxide I simply use F0 F1 universally and find alpha for every new substance I have to measure now TC PC VC and alpha if I measure four quantities I have got the complete equation of state for any substance because I have already made measurements for argon this comes from for example you do argon data give you F0 then carbon dioxide data give you F1 as being equal to PR for carbon dioxide minus if you like PR for argon remember PR for argon is exactly this F0 is PR for argon if I take this difference and divide by alpha CO2 I get F1 
I do have to measure PR as a function of FR, TR and I keep saying PR here this should be VR sorry this is VR I have got PR on the left hand side. Actually the more convenient way of doing it is to measure Z as a function of TR and PR. You need two variables on the right hand side the left hand side should be a dimensionless quantity. So in principle it is sufficient for me to measure carbon carbon dioxide data and argon data and then measure four quantities for each substance TC, PC, VC and alpha. Now this has been done for example in great detail by Haugen in Wisconsin there is a book by Haugen, Watson and Ragatz it is more of historical interest but it is a good book the three volume book on chemical engineering principles. I think volume 1 you use in stoichiometry in uh, your course in, right. So there are two other books second book is on thermodynamics which contains extensive calculations using this. See once I have an equation of state I can measure I can calculate phi all I have to do is lot of algebra I have to find V at every P and T differentiate with respect to Ni in a mixture and do this. I have to do the same thing for a mixture for a mixture alpha will be will have a suitable combining rule every parameter that appears in the base in the equation of state will have a combining rule. But if you do this first the first thing that you do is do this for pure substances and then for pure substances of course RT ln phi this is for pure substances or I write here pure 0 to P V minus sorry V by RT minus 1 by P DP V reduced by T reduced and I have to multiply by P. That is I do P by P C and then I have a P C inside here then I have it does not come out right let us let me do it this way P V by R T minus 1 D L N P P V by R T is the same as this it is equal to P equal to 0 to P this is P C V C by R T C P C into P reduced V reduced by T reduced here minus 1 D L N P reduced I am sorry P reduced therefore the limits will become P R equal to 0 to P R equal to If it is a two parameter equation of state like the van der Waals this is known this is only 3 by 8 so I can do this calculation once and for all and I can give the plots or the tables in the book and you can just use the tables directly. All you have to do is find what P by P C is you can then plot phi versus P R for various values of T R it will always go to 1 in the limit as P goes to 0. I think the plots go like this this is for different TRs this is the simple corresponding states simple corresponding states principle SCSP if you like for two parameter equations of state if there are only two parameters then ZC is a constant the two parameters can be determined in terms of PC, VC and TC and you can have a universal plot 
I think this is given to you in Smith and Van Ness. If you have a second parameter here alpha, then you will get a phi 0 and a phi 1. So, you get two plots, you can otherwise have let us call this phi 0 to indicate that it is for substances that are described completely by a two parameter equation state. Typically this would be obtained from argon data or methane argon and so on. Then there will be a second parameter you will plot phi 1 which corresponds to f 1 there against p r for various values of t r. I do not remember what the curve looks like. You get a series of graphs and you will get phi 0 phi is equal to phi 0 plus alpha phi 1. So, the easiest way is to do this to simply take the phi 0 graph take your t and p of the substance divide by t c p c produce the reduced coordinates at a given p r you go on with the correct t r and read the value of phi, phi 0 similarly read the value of phi 1 and do this calculation. So, all I need is one table that gives me T C P C V C and alpha. Now, there are many many parameters alpha that have been used, but the most successful one is called Pitzer's eccentric factor. Pitzer is a chemist, Pitzer introduced an eccentric factor on the face of it it is amazing how one would come come up with something like this. That is the definition of an eccentric factor. Pitzer's argument actually came from this. You know that if you plot log of the vapor pressure P saturation versus 1 by T, it is well known that you will get a straight line. As the temperature increases, you move this way and the pressure increases. So, you get a straight line like this. This is experimental observation. It is also a consequence of using the clausius clapeyron equation and the ideal vapor phase. You have d p by d t is equal to delta delta h by t delta v for vapor liquid equilibrium this is approximately equal to delta h by t v vapor and this is equal to for an ideal gas this is delta h by r t squared by p. So, you get d log p by d t is equal to delta h by r t squared if delta h is constant this is along the saturation curve when vapor and liquid are in equilibrium. So, log p plotted against 1 by t should give you a straight line for a given delta h if delta h is constant in actual practice delta h will vary with temperature but the variation is fairly small. This has been known experimentally and if you do this by in reduced coordinates that is if you plot log p r saturation versus 1 by t r still get a straight line and t r equal to 0 0.7 is approximately the normal boiling point. And you get a straight line for all for simple because the word simple begs the question simple gases typically inert gases and again methane spherical molecules you get nice straight lines. And it turns out that T r equal to 0 0.7 this point here this value I am plotting now log to the base 10 for convenience this was just numbers log to the base 10 P r saturation at T r equal to 0 0.7 P r saturation is approximately 0.1. This is an experimental observation for all simple substances.
I am sorry I take this back nor, not normal boiling this is close to the normal boiling point okay. I take this back T r equal to 0.7 is close to normal boiling point. It is close to but it is not exact at T r equal to 0.7 P r saturation is equal to 0.1 for inert gases. So, log to the base 10 P r will be minus 1, this is plus 1 minus 1 it will be 0. So, omega is approximately 0 for inert gases. For all other substances omega is different from 1. Omega is very many characteristics. First data is readily available this is P r saturation. So, you take saturation pressure vapor pressure of the substance at T r equal to 0.7. Then you get omega is readily available is, is measurable. It varies between 0 and 0 0.4 approximately, which is very nice for a Taylor series expansion because you are doing a Taylor series expansion with omega as a parameter. If omega is less than 1, then you have guarantees of convergence as a Taylor series expansion, and uh, so it should be small. That is another criteria that people came up with. If alpha is very large, then you get large deviations and you cannot do a Taylor series expansion conveniently. And thirdly it is a measure omega is a measure of eccentric nature of the intermolecular force. That is the intermolecular force effectively is like you take two molecules and model them like uh, spheres then you have to have a center of mass for each and a center of force for each because you have to know what the line of interaction is. And if the centers of force and centers of mass do not coincide the molecule is said to be eccentric the center of force not being centrally located with the center of mass eccentric if you like. So, what uh, what is actually discovered is that omega for example, for carbon dioxide is almost 0.38 I forget the exact value, but it is quite large. So, what has happened is omega this has become a very useful correlation this is the most popular correlation. So, you write plus omega phi 1 and in effect this is the only three parameter correlation that you have to know. It is widely used for gases and it gives you excellent correlations. This combined with the Lewis and Randall rule that is if you are dealing with mixtures the Lewis and Randall rule tells you that V i bar is equal to V i therefore, phi i is simply phi i pure and phi i pure is given by this phi pure is phi 0 plus omega phi 1. you will almost find 90 percent of treatment of gas phase non ideality uses this rule and therefore, you have to calculate only phi pure, phi pure is almost invariably calculated as phi 0 plus omega phi. There is a variation of this in the literature this is what is called a Lee Kestler equation of state because it has been very successful you have to know about Lee Kestler equation of state. Lee Kessler equation of state uses omega exactly like this. What it does is makes the equation of state interpolative because omega is 
0 for inert gases and some almost 0.4 for carbon dioxide all other gases behave in an intermediate fashion. So, you use an interpolative equation of state which essentially gets all the data for any substance between that of argon and carbon dioxide. So, the Lee Kessler equation of state essentially has a detailed equation of state, but it also calculates exactly like this phi 0 and phi 1 are calculated for the Lee Kessler equation. This has been done for several equations of state in particular for the Lee Kessler equation of state. That I will give you that uh, it is given I think in Wallace the detailed treatment is given in Wallace and there are also much more complicated equations of state. All I want to say about uh, equations of state and calculation of fugacity coefficients. We will just look at vapor liquid equilibria of various forms. In this case when I am talking about liquid I am talking about solvent solvent mixtures. Because if you have solvent solute mixtures you are either talking about solubility of a gas or solubility of a solid. So, I will discuss those topics separately, but if you look at solvent solvent mixtures the final diagrams are plotted like this. Let us look at binaries if you plot for example, isobaric data T these are plotted often like this. Let me explain all you do is take experimental data you take a mixture liquid mixture this can be x or y I take a liquid mixture of this composition let us say point A is a liquid mixture of composition x A at some sufficiently low temperature I increase the temperature to some point and at this point you begin to have vapor formation and the vapor that comes out has this composition. Actually I should have plotted it the other way around which is normal let me explain why. Normally if you have a binary you choose this x and y so that the more the x composition refers to the more volatile component so that the vapor is usually then the liquid forms this is the liquid this is the vapor. So, this liquid is in equilibrium with this vapor here the vapor line is on top. So, the composition y is larger than the composition x. So, I boil this liquid at this point the first bubble of vapor forms and this point is called the bubble point. If it was a if it was the pure substance there would be only one point at which the vapor and liquid will be in equilibrium, but I am talking about a mixture this point is called the bubble point. So, this is the composition y in equilibrium with so this will be y a star the star indicates that in equilibrium with x a. If you plot this y a star versus x a you can do this at every liquid composition if you plot y a versus x a it is usually plot is just y a this is the 45 degree line you could get for a curve like this you could get something like this this is your equilibrium curve. Incidentally conversely if you had started with complete vapor of this composition let us say this point is B if you had started with vapor of this composition and you had reduced the temperature you had cooled it at constant pressure all this is done at constant pressure 
you would have come to this point at which the first drop of liquid will form. This is called the dew point. After the fact that dew forms from air early in the morning when the temperature drops or very early I am talking about not early maybe 1 o'clock 2 o'clock whatever. So, two points characterize mixture the dew point and the bubble point if I have a vapor you talk of the dew point if you have this is one of concerns in chemical engineering and pumping for example if you are pumping a liquid and you do not want vapor to form if you are using a rotary device and if vapor forms the vapor bubble breaks on the blade and causes erosion. So, you do not you want it to be completely liquid you do not want it to be vapor. So, you will have to make sure the temperature does not go above this point as long as you keep the temperature below this point you would not have any vapor formation. And similarly if you are using a device for the vapor and you do not want liquid droplets then you will make sure the temperature is above this point so that you do not have. So, determining a liquid uh, dew point and bubble point will determine the operational temperature or for example the pressure that is this is the temperature diagram if you did an isothermal calc this is isobaric and this is of importance industrially because most industrial columns operate at constant pressure a very large fraction is atmospheric distillation. The other case is isothermal operation in the isothermal operation if you plot P versus X comma Y and you get this curve this way you get the curve the other way around. So, at constant temperature if you go from this point and increase the pressure at some point you will have condensation. Now, this is the liquid this is the vapor. So, this is the liquid in equilibrium with this vapor or if you start with the liquid for example and come down reduce the pressure finally, there will be a vapor formation of this composition. life is not quite as simple because this diagram can take a thousand shapes. For example, there are mixtures where the y does not always lie above I can plot either of these in this form at constant pressure or at constant remember you are talking about binary system I have to establish that let me establish degrees of freedom. The phase equilibrium problem simply tells you T alpha is equal to T beta, P alpha is equal to P beta also tells you mu alpha is equal to mu beta or mu i alpha is equal to mu i beta. I will say the general phase equilibrium problem. So, what are the variables? The variables in the problem are T, P, and mu i alpha, the whole set, which is actually 2 or T alpha, P alpha, and mu i alpha. So, 2 plus R components, alpha is the number of phases into pi phases this is number of phases this is number of components so the number of variables is simply equal to 2 plus r into pi what is the number of equations this is I fix alpha beta can run from 1 to pi minus 1. So, this is pi minus 1 equations this is also pi minus 1 equations 
this is again pi minus 1 for each component into r equations. So, the number of equations is simply pi minus 1 into r plus 2. So, the number of degrees of freedom is simply the number of variables minus the number of equations. So, r plus 2 is something wrong. Okay, this is all right. Is equal to I've got some r plus two. What's wrong? I have some more constraints. Is this all the number of equations? I claim there's one more set of equations. In fact, I've been talking about nothing but those equations. When? No, no, no. That's for specific uh, phases, right? I am talking about chemical potentials. What governs the composition dependence of the chemical potential? There is a Gibbs Duhem equation, right? So, there is one equation for every phase. So, I have plus plus pi, which is one Gibbs Duhem equation for every phase. So, you get minus pi here. That is, if you treat the chemical potentials as independent variables, you are talking of R intensive variables to describe each phase, but each of those R components is governed by a Gibbs Duhem equation. So, you have to take this into account. So, you get your famous rule is equal to R plus 2 minus pi. You can either do this or simply write this set of equations as mu i alpha is equal to mu i beta. You put a model for chemical potential that is you solve the Gibbs Duhem equation which is how we do it. We assume a model for g x s derive expressions for mu i in terms of x 1, x 2, x r minus 1 and write this equation as if it is an equation governing r minus 1 composition variables not r chemical potentials. That is the other alternative is T alpha is equal to T beta, P alpha is equal to P beta and mu i alpha which is a function of T, P and x 1 alpha to x r minus 1 alpha is equal to mu i beta which is a function of T beta, P beta, x 1 beta to x r minus 1 beta. Now, the number of variables is pi again it is pi minus the number of variables is pi variables pi faces each face has 2 plus r minus 1. Now, the variables are not mu i's, but these. Now, you have already solved the Gibbs Duhem equation because you have got composite independence. This is obtained from the Gibbs Duhem equation in each phase. For example, if you are writing the vapor phase, you will write this in terms of phigastic coefficients. You will calculate phigastic coefficients from an equation of state. So, it automatically satisfies the Gibbs Duhem equation because the phigastic coefficients are obtained from V i bar, V i bar is obtained from equation of state. So, those satisfy the Gibbs Duhem equation. In the liquid phase, you may use an excess free energy model. So, these are given I have given you this expression as a function of composition. So, you have only this many variables. Now, the equations are exactly as we have written down pi minus 1 to r plus 2. So, if you take v minus e you will still get the same equations f is simply equal to r plus 2 minus pi because pi into r plus 2 minus pi into r pi minus 1 to r plus 2 is exactly r plus 2 and then you have a pi left minus pi. Actually this is the way we solve the problem 
that is these are obtained from solutions of the Gibbs Duhem equations. How you solve it is a detail for the vapor phase you do not solve the Gibbs Duhem equation you simply go to the equation of state get vi bar get v for the liquid phase you go to g excess models. So in a sense this information is really empirical except that in most cases the number of components and the number of phases is fairly obvious so it is a very good rule. It is an exact rule but you do not know r and pi exactly all the time and therefore f is not known exactly. So coming back here we are discussing binary two phase equilibria so you have here r is equal to 2 and pi is equal to 2 so the number of degrees of freedom is 2 minus 2 plus 2 this is equal to 2 degrees of freedom. So if you fix temperature or pressure then the only freedom you have is either with liquid composition or vapor composition. So if I fix temperature and liquid composition everything else is fixed or if I fix for example pressure in this case I fix the pressure and I fix the li liquid composition automatically T is determined. So the number of degrees of freedom is you have to look at it carefully and that will tell you what measurements you need to make here for example very often you can measure T X and Y fairly straightforward that means you have one measurement more than is required in fact you measure P also you have two measurements more than is required. So you can actually use this data to verify the Gibbs Duhem equation now then they started actually up to about 40s by 40s they started believing it then they said verifying the internal consistency of experimental data if the data do not satisfy the Gibbs Duhem equation you tell him no this data is not right send it back to the fellow and ask him to measure it again and then uh, now it is just used people do not measure additional data because such a nuisance they just assume the Gibbs Duhem equation is valid and do the analysis. So let me get back here so the principle of all separation processes is to take an x if you let us do the isobaric case for example in a crude oil distillation column you take a certain composition x and you find the vapor comes out is y. Then you have a series the actual way the physical column is set up you would not recognize this because normally what you do is take a still in the laboratory at constant pressure and increase heat it till the two come to equilibrium and you measure this composition this composition that is how you do this in the laboratory but in actual practice the distillation column does not look like anything like what you have in the all you need is good mixing between liquid and vapor and then you get an equilibrium. So the actual distillation column as I said last time looks like this you have a column you have n plus 1 tray and the nth tray the liquid from the n plus first tray comes down here this is liquid and the vapor comes all over the place this liquid flows out this way and then flows down this way. So this vapor coming up bubbles through you must make sure that there is good contact between liquid and vapor here then the vapor leaving here and this liquid this is ln this is called vn this is the vapor leaving the nth tray this is the liquid leaving the nth tray these two are in equilibrium the composition of this if it was a binary system this xn and vn is what you read here if this is the nth tray liquid this liquid is in equilibrium with vapor which is much richer in component 1 in the first component. So as you go up you get a vapor that contains more and more oh I am sorry this is vapor this is yn this is xn as you go up you get a vapor that is richer and richer in the more volatile component and finally at the top if you have sufficient number of trays you will get pure component 1 if it is a binary you will get com pure component 1 and pure component 2 at the bottom that is all you do in binary distillation if it is a multi component distillation very often it is treated like a pseudo binary this is the most volatile component will be treated as one component all the rest will be lumped together as equivalent second component and you can do this treatment all the way down the column.